good morning, friends of Owl Rock United Methodist Church. Whether you're with us by live stream on Facebook, on our group page, the Owl Rock group, or you're um, viewing us as a recording, we're glad that you're here. You can skip ahead to the message if you'd like to. I'll put the minute mark number for that so that you can skip ahead if you like if you're watching the recording. But we're glad you're here and hope you'll join us again this Wednesday night at 6.30 Eastern for our Wednesday night Bible panel discussion with Gene Martino, Patricia, and me. Now I'm going to welcome everyone. Good morning, Al Rock. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming out on a very wet day. It's been raining pretty steadily all morning here in Atlanta, and I'm not going to shake my finger at the rain. We probably need it. Uh, rain's a good thing, and we get plenty of it here usually. We sure don't want the drought that some other areas are struggling with, and we haven't had any of the bad storms that other areas of the country have had. And so I think about my daughter every time that happens. They had another storm come through Louisiana. Did you see that? So it's been interesting for them down on the coast this season. Um, let me handle some announcements. Um, first of all, please uh, join us by Zoom or live stream this Wednesday. That's September the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Jean Martino and Patricia and I as we lead our panel discussion and we're going to be looking again at the parable of the wheat and tares which we didn't finish and partic particularly we're going to focus this week on wailing and gnashing of teeth which is a really interesting phrase that occurs only seven times in the New Testament and um, I'd like to uh, take a look at that this Wednesday night. I hope you'll join us. Also on Wednesday mornings you can join Jean Martino as I will be. You'll find me there. Um, at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 Central, if you'd like to join us for a discussion of John the Baptist. Uh, we'll continue that this coming Wednesday. Concerning charge conference, we're going to have to have some meetings, and David and I will have to do some paperwork. Um, the work that we have to do, the paperwork is due on, as you can see in the bulletin, Thursday, October the 28th at 7 p.m. That's the same day I'll be having a consultation with the DS. That's coincidental. It just happens to be the same day. Then on November the 15th at 7 p.m. will be our online charge conference. You can watch it on the Zoom link. You don't have to leave home. And we, I would like for all of our leaders, please, to um, be watching online for that event. It usually doesn't take very long. You know, with so many churches reporting at the same time, you can't do too many individual uh, reports, but you can go over one by one some of the items and that's what he'll be doing it usually doesn't take very long our district superintendent superintendent's name is dr michael mcqueen and we all address him as dr mcqueen and uh i hope that you will consider being present for that in the meantime the trustees have already met but we're going to need to have a meeting of the board and uh the finance committee and the board so uh and staff parish needs to meet right away too because our paperwork is due for uh, pastoral review, ministry review, and those forms are almost identical to last year. We'll just do the same thing again, and David will be handling that. He'll contact you who are on the committee. Um, that's what I have in the bulletin. By way of other news, we have a nice letter here that I just opened from Arthur and Al Mary Alice Ivy, and uh, they are the missionaries that we support in Peru, and this is their um, reporting letter that has photographs, lots of photographs. I'd love to show it to you. I'm going to pass it around. And they're just giving thanks and giving an update and asking for continued support. May I hand this to you? Thank you. And one other item, one other item from the conference. Um, I recently had a meeting of the district to um, go over our charge conference and how it will run, and there were some reports given prior to that, and one of them had to do with an offering. Um, they call it now Well Root Family Services, but it used to be the United Methodist Children's Home, and you probably know it by that name, but it's been Well Root for some time now, and we're going to have a special offering. I haven't set that date yet, um, it's designated for today. That wouldn't give us much time, but if you want to, I can place these in the offering plate for the next few weeks and let's 
see who would like to give over the next few Sundays and give others. To, well, this one got self-sealed. That won't do. Oops. And we'll put those uh, in the offering plate. And you can give to the children's home. And we have who with us by phone today, Erica. Patricia? Erica. Oh, hey, Erica. We're glad you're with us this morning. So even though that offering is today, let's do it for a couple, three weeks, because uh, we have got a small crowd due to the weather, and I'd like to have others have a chance to give to that, okay? Do you, do you know what children's homes are doing, Methodist children's homes are doing all over the country now? One of the things that changed some years ago, around the time that I was a foster parent, um, is that they started doing what we call um, therapeutic group homes, and they are doing a lot of great work. You, you know, we don't have the orphans they had back in the Depression in World War II. What we have are children who are pulled by the courts out of a family because the family illegalities, abuse, uh, neglect, those kinds of things. And so they train these foster families in therapeutic care. And they put a few together in a home with these trained therapeutic foster care parents. And um, we need to support that because there are so few options for kids who are in that environment. And sometimes they just fall between the cracks or they get bad foster parents or, or something from the state. It's much better for them to be in something more sophisticated like what we're offering. So please consider giving to them. That's the Amazing Grace offering. Did I hand you all of these, Patricia? Yeah, put them in the offering uh, I've got a few more up here. Okay. I'll, we'll, I'll put them down later. All right, any other announcements? Yes, no, maybe. We good? Should we be setting the date for our board meeting? Yes. Yeah, I think probably if, if Steph Parrish could meet and we'll set a date for that and finance. Now we can set finance and Steph Parrish for, Steph Parrish needs to be right away, but we can set finance for a week or two from now if you want to, or two, three weeks, it doesn't matter. But sometime this month or the first of next month would be okay. It won't, won't give us a great deal of time, but we need, we need to go ahead and see where we are. And David needs time not to be rushed at the last minute to kind of and as well as Paula. Paula's got a big report to do. Now Donna did hers already, but we're kind of in the lurch because our board chair Donna is very sick right now. So we're, we're going to have to kind of limp along without her and um, do the best that we can. And who's our vice? Are you the, are you the vice, Sandra? Okay. Um, I'm, okay. Well, I'm grateful to you. I, I, I will help you do everything that I can. I, I always help Donna. Sometimes I even re write or rewrite some of the things she sends me to, you know, to get it form ready. And I will definitely help you, okay, with everything, all right? My job, I'll do it. Here I am, Lord, send me. Do we need to meet at the church to talk about the financial piece? Okay. Yes, if we could just um, gather for a second, just for a second. I want to, I want to talk about how we might support a family in our congregation. So let's can we we could do that. I think that would be great. Anything else? Yes, sir. Nice construction going on out here. Thanks to Junior and Sandra. Thanks to Junior and Sandra, we uh, we had badly uh, damaged Eve out here at our handicap entrance on the side of the narthex back here at the front of our church, the back of our sanctuary, and. Um, it, the construction is well underway, and soon it will be, uh, I imagine it, soon it will be completed. It looks like they're well on the way to finishing it, which means they work pretty fast, and I like that. So thank you for finding them. We got a good price. We're happy. Thank you so much. It's looking really good. What'd they do with that stained glass? It's in the back room. We're going to do something with that. That's so beautiful. and. That's from Ann's family too, if I recall correctly, in memoriam. So I'm excited about that. Anything else? Thanks to Amy and the team who worked. Oh yeah, Amy. Oh, and thank fun. you for filling in for me. And Patricia and I really are grateful for that time away. I was telling a few of you beforehand that we had about 90% good. 
you know, sometimes vacations, especially when you're visiting with other friends and there's a lot going on, it feels a little less vacation-y than you want it to, but we got some good days together. As you could see from the pictures, it was pretty and we were happy. And did she look good in all those pictures, Every, except for the bazooka one? I'm not sure about the bazooka. Did you see the bazooka video? By the way, that wasn't a real bazooka. It was a toy that my godson, Shep, actually made. And it, and it shoots and it just shoots a plastic bottle. He puts something in it and then pours it out and sticks it in there and it's got a battery on it. You pull the trigger and the gases left from whatever that liquid is ignite quickly and the bottle shoots across the yard. So it wasn't a real bazooka. I, I don't think anyone would be smart enough to give Patricia an actual real bazooka. You don't want a real bazooka, do you? I think it would have knocked her shoulder off. Any other announcements? Lord, we thank you for this day. We're grateful for our lives and even for the rain today. We're so grateful for the way you have designed our creation. And we marvel at its complexity and its creativity and its beauty. We're thankful to be here today with one another. We ask that you, in the, by the power of your Holy Spirit and its presence to inspire us and speak to each and every one of us, revealing yourself to us more fully. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so let's uh, continue our worship service by singing our first hymn, which is Christ for the World We Sing, 568. Let's stand together and sing. of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated. Let's take a look at our prayer list. <clears throat> I think um, we can kind of, as a congregation, um, we can step up our care for, for Donna and for Scott and for Sean. She is quite ill. And it's a combination of things from what I've been told. Um, she's not talking anymore right now. And so keep in mind, however, they're giving her morphine to keep her calm and comfortable. She's on dialysis, which completely drains you. Um, there's a reason for the dialysis. She's having some problems with kidney. And um, she started her chemotherapy, which is once every three weeks. So between the chemotherapy and the, the um, dialysis and the morphine, she is uh, sick and quiet in bed. Um, she's unable to talk right now. So please, prayerfully, you can, you can uh, if you want to give to support for them and their expenses, you can give through the church. Just, desi just put designate for, for the um, McCain family and we'll take care of it and make sure that they get it. Also, uh, if you could just continue with your prayers and or cards and any contact. Um, Donna's not able to do her normal Facebook stuff, but Sean is online on Facebook and I have telephone numbers and an email address which I'll share with everybody. So please continue your prayers. Anything to add about, not any business or anything, but anything to add about prayers for Donna and Sean and Scott? Okay. She's at uh, Tanner in Carrollton, and that's room uh, 468. Um, so let's look at the list. We have others here. Oh, is that right? He didn't tell me that. Yeah, he said that they did call. Good. I, you all may remember from Rocky Head, the last pastor that they had, uh, Robert Manley. I sent him an email explaining the situation that we'd be out of town and that she was quite ill. And uh, he gave him a call while we were gone. So what a nice thing to have done. Also, Patricia knows a chaplain out there that we're hoping to kind of step up the visits with. So we're going to give them everything we can, okay? And y'all do that too. Not a good time for them right now. Um, Ashley uh, is my cousin. She's doing all right. Um, my parents are doing pretty well, all things considered. I see that Amina's still traveling. Um, I haven't heard about Darlene or Teresa recently, uh, but, uh, but if Ruby, if you will type, if you're watching, please type in something for Patricia and we'll be glad to give an update. Um, Patricia, we were still praying for Debbie. Yeah. She's um, continuing her treatment, correct? Mm -hmm. I'll talk to her this afternoon to get an update. Okay, good. You can take Christina off. We'll take Christina off. <coughs> Oops. I don't have my computer today, so I'm not watching. I've the wrong one. Okay. And I haven't been up on the news. I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what's going on. I guess Afghanistan is just a continuing problem. It's not like there's, I don't know if there's anything new to report there. Uh, victims of, of Ida and recovery. We leave that on? I don't think it'll hurt. Okay. And the Goodman family's still on here. Um, He's still struggling. So, I'd like to one more question. Okay. Bishop of the Methodist 
church in Rhodesia and became the um, head of the Secretary of Education in Rhodesia and then retired uh, while Joe and Veronica were here and moved to North Carolina. And he died a month ago. We just found out about it. Oh, I see. Okay, so let me get the names correct. The A-L-B-O-R-D. And uh, the former pastor's name? Judge Hart. And y'all remember his father died. And Joe's wife, and the, and the, and um, <coughs> the Al Mr. Albert's daughter is? Veronica, B-E-R-A-N-I-T-A. <coughs> And that's her father who passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. And I met Pastor Cheryl Max Hill. We found out she has leukemia. Cheryl does? Didn't she lose her husband? Bless her heart. Got it. Oh gosh. Where'd you hear that? Um, Junie. So Junie she told you? Oh, bless her heart. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Erica's mom's death uh, is next week, I think, to the second year. So this is one of her friends for her. This is the second year anniversary. We're thinking about you, Erica. Wow. I can't believe that's been two years. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, by the way, did we add anybody last week or the week before that I, I need to know of? Or did you all catch me up just now? You caught me up? Okay, thank you. All right, let's pray together. Lord, there's nothing that we can tell you that you don't already know. This, uh, but this is the calling of our hearts to speak with you with what's on them and to ask your help for us and for others who are facing um, crises of one kind or another, and we are particularly mindful of Donna and her family right now. Um, we put you in her charge. We call on the wisdom and talent and the medical expertise of those who are caring for her in the hospital. We ask that you enliven her spirit and give her the strength and the courage to recover. And we ask your blessing on Scott and Sean as they navigate the waters of caring for themselves and now for Donna too, for all of the stress and hardship and heartache that's going along with this. We ask your blessings on them that they might have a sense of your determination and your strength in this hour. We give thanks for Junie who continues to stay in touch with us and help in numerous ways. And we remember Erica today as she's remembering the anniversary, second anniversary of her mother's passing. We remember the Albert family, Veronita and Joe, at the passing of Veronita's father. We continue to pray for crisis in Afghanistan, for those who are recovering from storms and other natural disasters, including Ida. We pray for the Goodman family and their struggles. We pray for Christina, for Christine, 
Amina, Bob and Janet, Debbie. We pray for Ashley and Teresa and Darlene. We lift ourselves and our church up to you. Make us servants of your reconciliation, ministers and administrators of your grace. Allow us as servants of the living God to be emboldened by the one who is our high priest, Christ Jesus, who stands in our stead, whose righteousness is given by grace, and who offers us a faith that is everlasting. Allow us in this hour together to feel and experience that grace in you. For where we are weak, you can be made strong. And where we are incomplete, your perfect completion rounds off our rough edges and presents us without blemish before your throne. We thank you for your gift and we thank you for being a giver. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 100, in the back of your United Methodist hymnal, that is 821. When you find 821, please stand as you are able, and we will read... Psalm 100 responsibly. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the blessed of God's name, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. Our hymn is Depth of Mercy, that's on 355.
be seated. During this uh, moment, we're going to allow um, Jean to play a verse, but if you'd like at this time, you can place your offering in the offering place, which are in the middle of the aisle here. Or you can wait until the service is over and place it in there on your way out. It's up to you. Thank you, Jean. I wonder how many of you realize that we're biologically wired for endurance. You may not be aware of that. I'm one of those people who studies all kinds of weird and esoteric things, and I love cosmology, but I also love the studies of archaeology and anthropology and understanding of biodiversity and things like that. I, I watch a lot of bad YouTube videos. Some of them are good. Some of them are funny. And you may think that the, uh, a human being is pretty fast, especially if you look at Usain Bolt. Do you know who Usain Bolt is? He's the fastest man who ever lived that we know of. And if you've seen him run, you know how dangerously fast he was before his retirement. He holds the 100 meter world record. 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. That's just screaming fast for a human being. His absolute fastest speed, according to what I looked up during that race, was during his stride between the 50 and the 70 meter mark marks when he was running at 29.5 miles per hour, and his average speed for the race was 23.4 from a dead stop. 100 meters, that's fast, but let me remind you of something also you may not know. Cheetahs can run 70 miles an hour, not 30, 70. <coughs> Lions can run 50, tigers can run 40, bears and wolves can run 35. So even if you are Usain Bolt, which you are not, believe me, how are we supposed to, I mean, we're gonna be lunch for these people, for these critters, you know, lunch. There's no, <laughs> I remember one time on the beach, now. I may be speaking out of turn here and I may be making somebody mad out there in Briarcliff High School land, but there was a time when my brother was on the football team at Briarcliff and he was known to be one of the fastest, if not the fastest, on the squad. He never beat me in a race. One time he came close, which means that I was probably a little faster than everybody on the football team. Don't send me any emails. I, I can't prove that. No haters, you know. I, you lurkers out there, just zip it. And I, I can't prove any of that. And besides, you know, I was in the band and I was where I was supposed to be. After I broke my neck, I wasn't much interested in football anymore, for good reason. But antelope and gazelle and hares, things that we might have hunted thousands of years ago. I mean, horses and gazelles run over 50 miles an hour. How are we supposed to catch them? I ran 16 miles an hour according to my dad on the beach and I was flat out going as hard as I can. Which tells you how much faster Usain Bolt was than me. Horses, zebras, 40 miles an hour, how are we supposed to catch them? But it turns out that humans, while they are slow among the predators on the planet and have been for many, many thousands of years, 
There is no animal on the planet better than us at long distance running. For some reason, we can run all day. Not fast, but all day. Um, you may wonder why. Well, here are some reasons anatomically. Our skulls are balanced on the top of our spines. If you look at animals, their, their skulls are in the back of their heads so that their heads are forward, their paws are on down on all fours, their heads go straight out. They're not on the top of their spine, they're extending out. Their necks and muscles and shoulders and spines have to hold that head up at that angle over the ground. Ours is just neatly, the weight of our head is balanced on the top of our spine, which means that we are more efficient in, in our use of our head in general. First of all, by not having to haul it around, it's balanced nicely, but there is something called the nuchal ligament on the back of our skull that goes down to our seventh vertebrae that is unique on the planet. And what it does is it fine tunes the movement of our head for running. It doesn't kick in when we're walking. We don't need it when we're walking, but when we're running, it stabilizes our head. Have you ever seen those videos on the internet where the camera person was shaking it all over the place and then somebody came back with some sort of stabilization software and made it just, and locked it in. Frame for frame locked it in. Well, our heads do that so that we can see that lion or so that we can see that gazelle while we're running. Not sprinting, but like a marathon, long distance run, we can run all day. Now our shoulder blades and our collarbones, they are loosely connected to our upper spine like no other animal. And that reduces our ability to climb, but it greatly increases our ability to stabilize our whole bodies and our heads when we are running. Our smaller, relatively smaller and weaker arms, which are much smaller and weaker than our legs and much shorter, uh, they, they reduce our ability to climb but they increase our ability for balance, for carrying, and for manipulating objects while running. That's what it's for. The lumbar curve of our spine puts our center of gravity directly above our feet so that when we are running, and by the way, when we run, there's a point in time when neither foot is on the ground, but we don't lose our balance because of the stabilizing factor that our spines are right over our feet and they curve in such a way that it balances our heads right on top of it. It's perfect, not so much for walking. Walking is not a greatly efficient way to get around, but the way we run is spectacular given our anatomy. Our long strong legs proportional to our body are made for running. Our femurs are angled inward to the knees so that our knees are directly beneath our spine so that when we run, we are just straight as an arrow. Our large knees and hip joints, much larger than primates, for example. Our hip joints and, joints and knees are designed to support running. Our uh, feet are amazing machines. They are spring-loaded by joints, tendons and ligaments so and and our foot is arched like no other creature we are spring loaded for running now we don't use these features in our foot for walking they are used for running arch doesn't matter if you're walking but it matters a lot if you're running so why why are we geared for long distance running why are our bodies designed for a marathon now, I know probably nobody in the room here, I don't know, maybe Conal could go out and run a marathon right now. It takes a lot of training, but that's because it's not required of you every day to find something to eat and avoid a predator. But if you need to find something to eat every day and avoid predators, you need all of this. You've got to be a marathoner, and we are wired to do it. The People who study this say that we probably were gatherers and scavengers first, not hunters, which means we were gathering things that we could eat, like roots and berries and leaves, etc., fruit. 
but we also scavenged meat from kills from other animals. So why would running be necessary for that? Well, if you're a small tribe and you are looking for meat every day, you can greatly increase your chances of finding a carcass somewhere if you go out, spaced out, communicating with one another, and everybody jogging and scanning for the skies, for vultures circling, hyenas running, you analyze your environment so that you can find food and you can do that with great accuracy even while running and running cuts the day in half. You cover more territory, the chances of finding something to eat are greater when everybody's running. But then they realized at some point that they could do the same thing for hunting. And while they weren't fast enough to kill a gazelle because they couldn't run fast enough to get one in a sprint, they could run that gazelle into exhaustion to the point where it's just standing there and they could, they could walk up and hit it in the head with a rock. Too weak to run anymore. Too weak to fight. They found that they could even take it down mastodons or elephants or bear or they could take down anything once they had the tools and the know-how, but it was all based around the fact that their physiology was designed to exhaust the prey with long distance running. Endurance will not save you from a lion chasing you down. You've got to be smart, smarter than that. You've got to work together and protect one another, but it will help you track down a lion and you can kill it once it's exhausted. The sum of what I'm telling you right now is that as a species, we are terrible sprinters, but we are gold medal Olympic marathoners. In a long run, nothing can outrun us. We are just too good at it. That may be why we're here. It may be why we're, we look like we do. Not designed so much to walk, but to run long distances. Now I looked in the Bible and for wisdom on this matter and I found a couple of interesting things. First of all, uh, the word for hunt is sued and it only occurs in the Old Testament and it only occurs 15 times. And you may remember that Esau was said to uh, like to hunt while his brother Jacob liked to stay home at the tent. He was kind of a homebody. Uh, he worked around the, the house and around the encampment, but Esau liked to go off and hunt game. Well, did Esau have to go out and hunt game? No, it specifically says that his dad, Isaac, liked fresh game. So he'd go off to hunt it to make his dad happy. The days of the hunter-gatherer society were long gone by the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, Civilizations had occurred thousands of years before in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Mesopotamian area. You have cities popping up. You have uh, agriculture for the, for the first time. Um, so between 20,000 years and 10,000 years ago, you've got agriculture. You've got domestication of animals starting about the same time. Um, they started domesticating first dogs and then they started domesticating sheep and goats and then camels and horses, and then pigs last. Well, not pigs last, I think cats were actually last, which is probably the way I feel about it. Sorry, cat lovers, they're okay. I like dogs though. So uh, this word, it's called, it's sued, hunt. It, it's very rare in the Old Testament and it's non-existent in the New Testament. So I looked up the word for run. Now that occurs a whole bunch. But nobody's running down game. Somebody's running to greet someone. Somebody's running to help someone. Someone's running away from something or someone. Someone's running after something or someone. Someone's running to deliver a message. But nobody's hunting by exhaustion, run, uh, long distance running like our ancestors did. It didn't exa exist. And by the time of Jesus, running was mostly associated with athletic competition because they were still doing the Olympics in the Roman period. Did you know that? They were still doing it. So in 12 BC, Augustus, who was the emperor when Jesus was born, Augustus asked King Herod, the great of Judea, to subsidize the Olympic games and he sent gold. So while no Roman uh, ever entered this at the athletic events in Olympia, they were supporting it, except during the reign of Augustus, 
Some of his associates, including the future emperor Tiberius, who I know you've heard of, Tiberius won some equestrian events at the Olympics in Greece during the time of Jesus. So this was real. I mean, this is real competition, and it's involving the Romans. So Nero, who was ruling in the 60s AD, Nero postponed, <laughs> this guy's a mess. Nero postponed the, 19, the 65 Olympic, not 1965, the 65 Olympic Games. He postponed them a couple of years because he wanted to win all the chariot races and the thing was fixed. So, uh, so in the games, even though he was thrown from his chariot, he was still declared victory because victor, because the judges were, were afraid to give anybody else the victory. Who, who, were you gonna tell Nero? Crazy Nero, you gonna tell him he lost? And get this you American idol lovers and voice lovers. Nero thought himself to be quite the musician and singer. He was deluded like many of the people. <laughs> Do you ever look up the worst singers on American Idol and laugh till you cry, right? So Nero added singing competition to the Olympics. I kid you not. And he entered the competition and despite being a terrible singer, he won because the judges were afraid to award it to anyone else and because he paid them off. So Simon Cowell took the money and voted for, voted for Nero to win. And after his assassination, the Olympic Committee got together and made them pay back the bribe money. And they nullified, voided the entire 65 Olympics because Nero had so botched the whole thing. The popularity of the games fizzled over the centuries and disappeared around 400 AD. But all of this is to say this. When Paul wrote about foot racing, which he did several times, everyone knew what he was talking about. When he wrote about foot racing, he often did so to emphasize something about our spiritual lives. And I thought about that when I was uh, in uh, Corinth. I went to Corinth, Greece, and uh, I did some teaching, and Charles did some teaching, and um, I had a list of things I wanted to find, and one of the things I wanted to find was the actual starting line for the big race that they had there in preparation for the Olympics. They had you know, qualifying trials or something. And so the excavators had found this long uh, cut stone there in the main forum. And it had been covered by dust by the time I got there. I had to kind of broom around to find it, but I found it and took a picture. I wanted to stand on that starting line and remember what Paul wrote about in terms of running the good race and running with endurance for the finish line and how to do that because, you know, endurance can be tested. Donna's endurance is being tested right now in a way she's never experienced before. Some of you have been tested time and time again. How does one endure? If we are wired biologically for endurance running, could we also, based on Paul's analysis, be wired for a kind of spiritual endurance? That's my, that's my question this morning. Hupomene. Hupomene is the word endurance. It occurs 225 times in our New Testament. That's a lot. Endurance is important to your New Testament scriptures. Look at the back of your bulletin, for example. I put these few verses on the back of the bulletin for those of you who are watching at home. Hebrews 12, 7, endure trials for the sake of discipline. You know, when, when trials are there, you, you don't appreciate them. Sometimes when you look back, you realize what you gained in the way of stamina, perseverance, patience, character, maturity. In the letter to the Romans in chapter 5, Paul wrote, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Something about love plus suffering equals an endurance that produces character and hope. That's powerful. And then love also fuels endurance. First Corinthians, Paul wrote in chapter 13, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. With love, we can and we do endure. In Colossians, he wrote, this is chapter one, verse 11 and 12. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. And perhaps my favorite metaphor of, of endurance as racing comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great, great a cloud of witnesses, when you think of a cloud of witnesses, think of an Olympic stadium full of spectators. We are surrounded, for this race, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight. What did the people who ran how did they run, these racers? How did they run? Stripped down naked. They peeled off all weight, anything that would cause weight, including their own clothes, and they ran, carrying nothing. And the writer of Hebrews writes, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clothes, clings so closely, clings like clothes. And let us run with endurance the race course that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the starter and the finisher. Who's the starter? Jesus. Bang! Who's the finisher? Jesus. Checkered flag. He's the starter and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. What's the joy? The finish line. The joy, he, he ran with joy for the finish line set before him. And to do that, he endured great suffering. It says here, he endured the cross. That was the pain of his endurance. For a marathon runner, it's that pain that you feel in your chest. Your heart's pounding, you're breathing. You, every muscle is aching and hurting. Everything's telling you to stop and you will yourself on. You find a second wind and sometimes you find a third. Have you run before? You ever gotten a second wind? Boy, that is such a great feeling. You, you work through that knot that just develops in every muscle and your breathing is so labored and irregular and you settle in, all of a sudden it just gets smooth and easy. Not perfectly easy because running is hard, but it, something happens and you get in a zone and you get in a groove. It says he endured the cross disregarding its shame. There's no shame here. No shame in his nakedness on the cross. No shame in his woundedness, no shame in his dying. As he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured from sinners like us such hostility against he himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. What's the finish line for Jesus? Getting to, it's enduring the cross. His finish line is us because we're the ones that he doesn't want to grow weary or faint-hearted in our endurance. He endured for us and finished the race and runs with us and encourages us and strengthens us for our race. That's his joy. We're it. That's powerful. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, so do not run aimlessly. So I do not run aimlessly nor do I box as though beating the air. You know, this is not practice. This is not wandering around. There is a goal. There is an aim. There is a finish line. And in Philippians 3, he wrote, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the mark, the finish line, for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. 
To Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Last night, and Patricia and I were moved to tears. We were watching uh, a YouTube channel where this fellow interviews people who are experiencing the dark side of life. Homeless people, addicted people, prostitutes, people raised in incest in Appalachia, people on Skid Row, pimps, addicts, you name it. He gives them a little money and asks them if they'd be willing to share their story on camera. And you'd be surprised how many people were willing to do that. His most recent video, the channel is called yeah, the dark, the, some, the, is it white soft white oh. underbelly, soft white underbelly. And so uh, I was looking at it last night with Patricia and there is a, um, a woman there named Marisol and they call her Mari for short. She uh, was raised in North Chicago and I can't say out loud what happened to her. Over and over again, every day, for at least eight years of her childhood, at the hands of her older brothers. I can't say out loud what happened. But you know what I'm talking about, and you can imagine. Her mother was abusive to her and then left. Her father worked so many jobs, he was rarely home. She was so angry and lost at school that she uh, became uh, violent and she fought all the time. And finally she blurted out to the counselor at the school what was happening to her at home. Police came. The entire family rejected her, disowned her, and blamed her. Like it's her fault that when she's eight years old, they're doing this to her every day. Like it's her fault. She said she went for counseling finally to get some help and this brilliant counselor helped her so much. She learned that it wasn't her fault. She learned what healthy boundaries were. She learned what healthy touch was. She had to relearn everything that she should have learned long ago and she had to unlearn some things that she never should have learned at that age. She kind of spiritually started all over again. She only sort of half-heartedly once tried to commit suicide by taking a bottle of Advil, but all it did was make her sick. She realized I'm never gonna do that again to me. Why should I abuse myself just because someone else abused me? And she learned how to stand up for herself and she learned through the counselor how to fight but something still wasn't right. She says, I don't know. I wish, I wish I could show you the recording right here in front of me. She said in the last of that interview, I don't know whether this really happened or it was a dream and I don't care. It worked. She said, I dreamed I was in the back seat of a car and the window was open and the sun was shining on my closed eyelids and when you see the sun through your closed eyelids, you know how they look pink? The back side of your eyelids, they glow a warm reddish color. And she felt that warm breeze on her skin and she said, for the first time in my life, I felt a peace that I don't understand. It came from outside of me and went in me and through me and I felt no anxiety, I felt no hate. I felt no violence, I felt no fear. And then I heard my own voice say to me, and it was my voice, but it was older, different, sweeter, calmer. And I heard my own voice say to me, Mari, you've had enough. It's time to move on. 
It's time to forgive and it's time to live. She said, I felt like I was asleep, but I think I was awake. And I can't explain that, and you can call me crazy if you want to, but in that moment, I cried for an hour, and I forgave them, and I wrote them. I wrote them each a letter, and I didn't dismiss what they did. I called it what it was, in all honesty, but there was no vindictiveness, there was no rage, there was no hate, there was no bitterness, there was no grudge. I, I said, I forgive you and I love you. You will always be my brothers no matter what. And I let it go. Those who have gone before us are a great cloud of witnesses. That's a lot of forgiving. That's a lot of suffering, a lot of enduring, and a lot of forgiving. And the writer of Hebrews says, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, whatever, whatever it is, including bitterness and unforgiveness. And let us run with endurance the rates set before us. This is not a sprint. This is a pace, finding my pace for the long run. Sometimes I run too fast and I run out of gas. And sometimes I save too much gas and I'm going too slow. But if I can just find that notch, that zone, that second wind, that high that comes in running, if I can find it, I can run forever. Let us look to Jesus, he wrote. The founder, the, 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 the starter, and the perfecter or completer or finisher of our faith. His finish line was the joy that was set before him. The race is long and it is grueling. He endured disrespect, he endured rejection, he endured the cross, and he disregarded the shame of it all. And the reason Jesus endured, the writer says, and I want you to hear this, the reason Jesus endured from us sinners, such hostility against him himself. The reason Jesus endured was so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted today. He endured for you. That's what the writer says. You were the joy that was set before him, that gave him the strength and endurance to suffer what he suffered. You, it was you. You were his finish line. You were why he ran. And what I'm asking you, and I think the writers of the scriptures are asking you, is that perhaps you might consider that Jesus could be your joy and your finish line. The great prophet Isaiah wrote, The Lord gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is Are Ye Able, 530. 530 in the Red United Methodist Hymnal. As you're able, let's stand together and sing.
face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Join us on Wednesday at 6.30 Eastern for our Wednesday evening panel discussion on Zoom and on Facebook on the Hour Rock group. Thanks for being with us and you can also check out these videos on YouTube on my channel, Bert Gary, B-E-R-T space g-a-r-y it's all lowercase you'll see my picture you'll know where to go thanks come back with us share again at a time of worship bye-bye